Principles of electricity. Let's talk about those. Whoa, that was really fast. Okay, so identify principles, including direct and alternating electrolysis, electromagnetism, sketch series and parallel circuits and apply Ohm's law. And we're gonna apply Ohm's law to those series and parallel circuits actually. So it says in here, a basic knowledge of electricity helps you then leapfrog into more complex systems and applications, right? And then it gives you a basic understanding of electricity you require to complete an appliance installation. I don't even know if that's true. Create comfort in your home and ensure convenience for the user. I don't think so, but we're, we're gonna go through it. So electricity. Electricity is the production, yes? It's the production, transmission, and the safe use of invisible form of energy. All right, that's great. So what we do is sometimes we have, uh, they're talking about here dams, right? Right in here. So a lot of times that's called hydro electricity. We don't have a lot of hydro electricity here in Alberta because we don't have really big lakes and rivers. We do have some. There is some, let me not, you know, but we don't have a lot, not compared to like BC or Quebec or Ontario. We don't have that amount like those guys. Isn't there a hydro dam out at um, CB Extra? There is a small hydro dam there. Yes, very small. And I think they use that power to run that plant that they have up there, that uh, concrete plant. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I don't think they're putting a lot of hydro power into the grid, so to speak, for consumption. Are you referring to Lafarge or Greymont? I don't know. One of the ones up there, or both of them up there. CB Dam. It's a good place to fish, down in the bottom of the dam. Great, lots of trout in there, by the way. I go bridge jumping and cliff jumping over there. Really? Yeah. Well, that's damn dangerous, babe. Well, I don't jump at the dam. It's like drinking black ice beer. It's dangerous. I, I, I lead a risky life. You know? it's, the, it's the next step to homelessness, drinking that stuff. Yeah, I've been there. It's not that bad. Oh, okay. So it says here that power plants or the power that we use is created by rapidly spinning generators. And there's two important parts that are used to create that electrical energy. And they call that the stator and the rotor. Um, and if you don't really know what it is, I have a picture. Let me just um, put a picture in here on that. And it's, it's a motor, but it still has the stator in the rotor here. Let me just. So this picture kind of shows, uh, so this is the stator right here. So this is the coils. These are coils of copper actually. And then the rotor is the thing that spins in the middle. So as this spins, it creates this magnetic field and it casts off electrons. So there's all these electrons that are being thrown down a wire. And this is the electricity we use, okay? So the two important things here are the stator and the rotor. And once we get this thing spinning around and around and around, we're creating electricity. Now in a dam, in a hydro dam, they have uh, what are they? they have these like paddles, right? Basically these paddles. And what they do with these paddles is they tend to um, they get the water and they pour the water through on these paddles and it starts spinning. And this is what happens inside, is it starts spinning. 
Now for fossil fuels like natural gas is what we do is we put a big boiler in and uh, we create steam and then we drive steam through these turbines. And it's really the same thing. We drive steam through this thing like that and it spins it, right? We get high pressure steam spinning a generator or a, I, I don't wanna call it a generator, but it's basically what it is, okay? And it generates electrons, right? Just produces all these electrons and then they put it down the wires and the wires that they put it down are the ones like these right and we are then able to use this power to energize all of our little gadgets and everything else well we could see each other like this any questions Pretty straightforward. Okay, so let's go down to page three here. Whoa. So we have a distribution system all over the place and depends where you live. Sometimes they're on poles, the wires, or sometimes they're buried in the ground, right? Sometimes we bury everything in the ground just so we don't have all those poles running around the streets, right? But the energy produced by these big plants is pretty high electrical energy. So what do we use to use for our own house? We have to get it down to a usable form. So we use these things. What is this thing here? What is this picture of? Transformer. It's the transformer. And this is not, you know, Autobots, you know, come together kind of transformer. I don't know if anybody's seen those movies, but you know. It's a Decepticon. Yeah, it's deception, all right. <laughs> so, so this this says it's from thousands of volts to tens of thousands of volts on those wires, depending on the type and size of the power plant. Now, last time when I was in Mexico, I went golfing and they have power lines running along the golf course. And those things are crackling and humming and it was like frightening to be around those wires it was you could hear it you could hear the hum of those wires you could hear that electrical energy flying down those wires it was actually quite scary would, would you say that you could hear the ohms <laughs> ah you're so funny babe okay so and then it comes down to we have typically 240 volts coming into our household, and then we actually step it down again, and 120 volts is basically our, let me, let me circle that again, basically is what we use for most appliances that we do. Now, electrical dryers, they say 240 volts, but that's, that's okay. That's just another uh, form of power now. Here we have what is known as a transformer. And it's dependent upon the wires that are wrapped around the transformer. Inside this, there's an iron core. Let me just uh, get a little block here. So if we have a block, oh, that's really sad. Okay, there's much better. And we have another one inside. And then we have coils of wire. Now, depending on the coils of wire around, it's how much it steps up or steps down that power, right? So typically we would have 120 volts coming in. And then on most of the transformers, if you see this one here, it says 25, yeah? Everybody see that? So that would come down to what we now know as 24 volts. And this is AC power. Only AC power can work transformers. And AC power is called alternating currents, right? So it's alternating. And we'll talk about that a little bit more uh, coming up. 
but you could see something here as well. Let me just, you, can you see this, what it says in there? Does everybody see that? You see that? What does that say? 12VA, can you see that? I'm not getting any kind of yeah. indication. Yeah. Okay, thank you. That's all I'm looking for, yep. Yeah. I nodded a few times. What's that? I nodded a few times. Well, I think you nodded off to sleep, though, Jen. I'm, I'm not nope. sure that you... I'm actually wide awake. Okay. So this is a VA rating, is what that is. And the VA rating is indicative of how much that that transformer can handle. And how they get the VA rating is they take their volts and they times it by their amps. And that equals the VA rating. Okay, so this is something on a side. It's not, I may ask you a question on the assignment, but that's fine. Just take your volts times your amps and to find your VA rating. So you never want to exceed a VA rating on a small transformer. If you do, which means if you put too much load on the 24 volt side, you will overheat it and will burn out. So that's what happens. People put wires on these and they run too many devices, right? They run too many devices and this thing burns out and it becomes no good, okay? So you never want to exceed a VA rating on a transformer. They all come with VA ratings. I just wanted to mention that. So then we go into electron theory. So the study of electricity begins with this electrical theory. Now we know what electricity is but we have to understand the building blocks of matter. Oh hey, Doug, I got a question for you. Not yes, that you sir. might know the answer for it, but the VA rating, so V or the volt amperage or the volt amp rating, that would have a direct dialect to, uh, uh, crap, whatever it is in your house, like a 120 volt breaker or 13 amp breaker? No. Uh, no, no. It has nothing to do with the breakers and only being able to run so many things off one breaker at a size. It, never mind. It's it's something like that. So, for example, here, hang on a second. I'm gonna, I'm gonna. I have it. Okay, so matter. If I don't mind. It don't matter. Maybe you like that one, Alex. That's, that's your dad joke of the day. Okay. So examples of liquid matter. What the heck are they talking about here? There's three forms, solids, liquids, gases, gasoline. What, what are they talking about here? I don't even know. Uh, all forms of matter, most familiar states exist in the amount of heat contained in them. Okay. This I don't even think this is relevant to what we're talking about. Let's go to the next one. Elements. Okay, we talked about elements before. We know what an element is, I think, right? In our previous, we have a periodic table of elements. I think I even showed you guys one of those. Um, water is a compound made of elements, right? Hydrogen, oxygen. Molecules, atoms. Okay, that's awesome stuff. And then we have these number of electrons going around a nucleus or orbiting. You see this orbit that we have going around here? But it kind of more looks like this. They, they go. Like, right? They kind of orbit like that like our planets almost. And these little electrons that are floating around these out, these electron shells that go around these items 
And so the ones that we want, um, like I'm not going to go too much into this, but the further away an electron shell, this is the electrons on the ends here, from the atom's nucleus, the easier it is to knock that electron out of its shell and force it into another atom. So we use products that have this. So copper has these outer electrons that are very far off the orbit of the nucleus. So we use copper as a conductor. And that's really what they're trying to talk about here is that these electrons that are floating around these copper um, nucleus here, they're easily knocked off to the next one. So that's why we use copper as a conductor. Gold is a good conductor. You know, they had aluminum before, they had aluminum in our, in our houses before, but it heats up too much. Um, and, and that's why we don't use aluminum for electrical uh, energy anymore or to conduct it down a line. Now, is there any questions just, on that? Did they just move to aluminum wire because it was cheaper? No, aluminum wire, they stopped using it because it heats up too much. But before they used aluminum, they used copper. Uh, we don't use aluminum anymore. We use copper now. But also before they used aluminum, right? Yes, it was, it was just readily available. We had lots of it. It's still lots of it in the world um, and it's mined quite extensively. Um, but we figured that people's houses burned down more easily. But old, old houses use copper, like 1910 houses. And then 1950s houses or 70s houses use aluminum and then they go back to copper at some point. Yeah, I don't know. They thought maybe it was maybe it was cheaper. Um, that I can't I can't really speak into that. Um, I know I was alive in the 70s, but I listen, I was just a kid. So I didn't know anything. So yeah, good good point. It could it could be that it was cheaper at a time, so that's why we used it, but. Copper is the best conductor that we could use. I mean, gold is better and silver is better, but they're way too expensive to use. But that's why we use gold and silver ends on our gaming machines and our cables. Isn't that right, Alex? Going back because of your age, Doug, I have a question for you. When sure. they used knob and tube, did they use aluminum wire too? Yes, they could have. And that, and it had like a cloth coating over it. Like it was really, it wasn't <laughs> plastics. We, we didn't really have that plastics um, yet either. So it was like a cloth coating around the wire. Fuck. Yeah. Woohoo. Uh, have you seen the knob and tube stuff in some old houses and stuff? Yes, it was very popular in Southern Ontario when I grew up. Mm hmm. And all those wires were bare in the attic. It was quite crazy, wasn't it? Good money for electricians, though. They started making lots of money off of it. Yeah, on replacing everything, yeah. So this flow of electrons down a conductor is called current. So that's what we classify as current. And current is measured in amps. And sometimes we call this amperage intensity. So it is the amount of electrons being pushed down this conductor, right? That's the intensity of the electron flow. And we call it the amperage. You could back up a second, Doug. You cut out for like 10, 15 seconds. <laughs> I did? Yeah. And I don't know what you're talking about with intensity right now. Okay. So intensity or the current is the amount of electrons that are getting pushed down the conductor. And our conductors are mostly copper. Now, the amperage, um, or we measure this current in amps, and sometimes we call it intensity, okay? So it's, it's three words in one. So current 
is equal to the amps, which is equal to the intensity. It's a, these are three words we use to describe the electron flow down a conductor. Okay. So sometimes they use the word amps and we use it uh, as compared to a flow rate of water in a pipe, kind of like gallons per second. It's how much we have, right? It's the amount of flow, basically, okay? Does, it, does that, did that kind of come up? Sorry, I, I blacked out there. I don't know why. It's just my internet. I don't know, it seems like the internet is iffy lately, all over the place. I'm not the only one, but there you go. So then we're gonna come to voltage. Voltage, as they describe it here, is the imbalance of electrical distribution or charge difference between two points. So if you can see down here, we have positive and we have negative, right? Voltage is the difference between, or the difference in charge between two points. And when you have a difference in charge, like, can you see how we have a lot more electrons here or negatives than we do positives, yes? So they will rush over that way. They will move. They will move down a conductor quite easily because of the difference or the potential difference in a circuit. Let me write that down. Potential difference. And we can only measure voltage when there is a potential difference. Okay, it's the only time we can measure these voltages. Okay, so down here in this note, we wanna say voltage exists between two different points, but voltage is measured across a device, between two conductors or between two separate points. Voltage is the measurement of a difference in charge or sometimes what we call a potential difference. So as we move on, this voltage, sometimes they call, they make it E. And I wanna say it E means electromotive force. So the electromotive force is equal to the voltage. Okay. And this is called the pressure. So sometimes if we're talking about say water in a piping, this is the pressure. The voltage is the pressure in the system, okay? So listen, if more voltage is applied, you know, they have here more current will flow. If appliances and electric components cannot withstand higher current flow, an electrical fire may result, or if we have a circuit uh, breaker, it will open, right? That spring-loaded circuit breaker, once it starts pulling too much voltage or too much current, that spring-loaded circuit breaker will open and shutting off the circuit. And it, this is a safety feature that we build into these electrical panels to protect us because if we didn't protect ourselves, there would be many more plumbers dead. Probably. So just a quick question about this. Okay, sure. So basically if amp is the flow of the pipe in the water, then voltage would be the pressure pipe pushing it? That is correct, 100%. Pressure would also create drag on a system too, right? Because it would be dragging the voltage out, say into oh, the pipe. Oh, so you're, so you're talking about resistance now. Yeah. Okay, so resistance <laughs> in the next screen, 
Okay, but first we want to talk about six methods of producing voltage first, and then we're going to talk about resistance. So it's a good thought, and it's and it's a great thought pattern, Richard. That's exactly right. So these are six methods of producing voltage. So magnetic. So we have alternators and generators producing that EMF. Remember what that stands for, EMF? Electromotive force. This is electromotive force. Or we have chemical. We could have chemicals that produce EMF. Your car battery, for one, is a chemical battery where we have uh, different plates in a battery. So in a battery, they have different plates put in there and we have electron flow going through because it's also in some kind of an acid that produces or allows that electrons to flow from the positive or from the negative to the positive, yeah? We have these little posts in here and this goes. Friction. Well, if anybody knows about friction is Christian. You know that you can pick up a lot of free electrons just by rubbing your feet across the carpet, right? You can pick up those free electrons that are hanging around. And then when you touch something, there's a static release or all those electrons now want to jump, if you will, to whatever it is that you're touching. And that's where you get that little spark, right? Because you have all these electrons hanging around. And then they discharge, they jump from one thing to another. Like when you go to grab a doorknob and you feel a little spark, that means you had a whole bunch of electrons hanging around and it just jumps off. Yeah, Does that makes sense. That's friction. Now heat, okay, we have heat that will create electron flow or electromotive force. And we talked about thermal piles and thermocouples. I think I explained that a little bit uh, to you in class um, when we're in welding shop, I think. And what kind of what kind of device does that? Can can you tell me what that is called? What kind of device? Does anybody remember? The one that's listed right below, a thermocouple. He gone again. A thermoelectric device. I'm gone again, Christian. You're back. I, I just paused. I was waiting for somebody to give me an answer. A thermoelectric device is a thermocouple or a thermopile. A thermopile is just a bunch of thermocouples together to make more voltage. These thermocouples produce about 30 millivolts DC, but a thermal pile produces about 750 millivolts DC. So it's a whole bunch of thermocouples tied together. Also, we have pressure to produce voltage. Um, and these <laughs> this pressure, uh, one of them is a piezoelectric. You ever have those little push button starter uh, electrical producers like on your barbecue? Little click, click, click. That's a piezoelectric starter. It's just the pressure is creating um, uh, that goes across this crystal and it produces a spark. That's all it is, right? It's, it's really all it is piezoelectric barbecued igniters, right? And then we have light that also produces electron flow or electromotive force. And these are photovoltaic solar cells, right? And this actually also produces DC current, right? They definitely produce direct current, these photovoltaic things. Now, resistance. So this is the third one into this. Resistance 
Listen, all materials and all people have some resistance. Well, maybe after you drink black ice, I don't know. But materials with low resistance are referred to as conductors and materials with high resistance are called insulators. Resistance is defined as the opposition of materials that offers to current flow due its, to its structure. So sometimes resistance and on an electrical circuit is uh, actually referred to as ohms or sometimes friction. So we will have, if we refer it back to water flowing in a pipe, we're going to have resistance to flow or friction losses all the time. When we start using different kinds of pipe, when we use valves, when we use elbows, 90s, whatever, you're going to have a certain amount of friction or resistance. And this is basically the same thing, only in an electrical circuit, you're gonna have these resistance. So resistance can also be defined as the property of a circuit or device that opposes a flow of current. This is exactly what Richard said earlier. And we use R to do that. So we have three separate things and we're gonna talk about that a little bit more. Um, resistance is measured in ohms and is re represented by the symbol omega. That symbol right there, omega. So you could say the resistance of a device is 40 ohms and we could write it like that. Okay. Now they give you a little symbol here. This symbol is really what a resistor looks like. So if we have a, just like that, and that is called a resistor. And every resistor will have a certain amount of friction or a certain amount of resistance or a certain amount of ohms. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. So here we have this little presentation that I wanna show you. So let's start. So I just want to explain a little bit about this. Um, yeah, this was made for plumbers, gas fitters, but don't worry, this is still introductory. It's not gonna go into too much detail. Um, but the three things you see on the screen, the one on the left is a low water cutoff for a boiler. The one in the middle is a flush valve for a urinal. And the one on the right is a wiring diagram for a, um, a, a furnace, uh, and that's a forced air furnace. So any one of these, um, as plumbers and gas fitters, as we get farther along in the trade, we should be able to understand these things and then repair these particular products or replace. This is part of our, what we do, okay? So that's basically what a, a Hertz is. And some of you guys buy your big, big TVs and they're running at 240 Hertz, maybe even more, 520. 
um, whatever it is. Um, so most appliances run at 60 Hertz. Now, have you ever seen in a, uh, a an older film or even in a baseball stadium where they have an old, an older um, board to show the scores? And if they're doing slow motion, it, it flashes, right? You could see it flashing behind you or in the camera. That's what you see. You see this going from zero to positive to zero to negative to back to zero. You're seeing that cycle of electricity pulses. LED lights don't show that pulse, but your typical household bulb flashes 60 times a second. It's just that it, it goes so fast, our naked eye cannot pick it up. Now, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just pause this for a second. I'm gonna go back to this little video. And we're gonna play. So that is true about DC current. It does not alternate between the positive and negative. Yes, that's right, Matthew, it is the neutral. Um, and if you open up an electrical panel, you will see that uh, it actually goes to ground. But basically it completes the circuit. We have to have a start, we have to have a finish, but that's correct. So I'm just, uh, I was commenting on the chat in there. So I'm gonna stop sharing for a second. Um, I'm gonna go back to the ILM and we're gonna talk a little bit more about this alternating current before I move on. So let me go back to the ILM and here it is. And they start talking about electrical current in a so alternating current, as they say right here, is produced by the generator's rotor, which has many wires spinning inside a magnetic field that has poles. So the poles of a magnet are given a designation. One is the north pole, which is negative, and the south pole, which is positive. As that rotor spins, the wires near the North Pole acquire that negative charge, while the wires near the South Pole becomes positive. And as the motor moves around the circle, the wires start to lose their charge and come around. It really casts off those electrons. And as you can see, this goes from the North goes around north and south, north and south. It keeps going and it changes. So there is this wave, some, we call this a sine wave. And you could use it, you could find out that sine wave on oscilloscope and you could figure that out. But what this is really trying to tell us right here, look, it says voltage, a cycle, and how much time it takes. So what they want us to sort of know is that power is equal to energy over time. The power is equal to the energy over time, and sometimes watts is referred to power. Because nowadays, everything, is, a lot of things are measured in watts. A lot of our appliances are measured in watts, and it tells us how many watts it uses per hour 
or kilowatts per hour usage of that particular appliance. When we buy a new stove or fridge or whatever, it tells us that. Now, these generators uh, used to produce alternating current spin quite rapidly, usually about 3,600 revolutions per minute and that achieves that 60 cycle electrical current that we use. Generators have many magnetic fields in it as well, and allowing that power plant to produce what we know as three phase power. And that gives us the ability to produce big power and put it down all those long, long wires, right? That we have all across the country. And then we go into direct current, and that's really the same picture that I had in my little video right there. But you got to know that electrical current always goes from the negative to the positive only. Negative to positive is how DC current or direct current, this is direct current we're talking about. DC current always goes from negative to the positive. Electromagnetism is the next thing on this list. So we talked about a little bit about electromagnetism. And as I said before, electromagnetism is simply taking an iron core. So I had a, if I had an iron core like this and I took copper wire, for example, and I wrapped it around that iron core and I put electrons down this copper, this creates a magnet. and it becomes an electromagnetic device. And this is what we're talking about in here in your thing. So electromagnets down here at the bottom have several wires uh, wrapped around an iron core and it could be in any shape, whatever that may be. So um, that's really simply an electromagnet. Now, these electromagnets are used in many different controls we use in electricity. This is a solenoid valve. So we can actually draw an electrical solenoid just like this. So in, in, if I'm drawing a solenoid of some sort in a wiring diagram, it will look like that. And what happens when we put electrons in here and they flow, this actuates that magnet in there, opening up a valve, allowing something to flow. Water, gas, oil, I don't care what it is, but it's just basically a switch that has an electromagnet in it, right? Is a solenoid. All it is. Now, the biggest advantage for these is that as soon as I stop the electron flow, that no longer becomes a magnet. It shuts off immediately, which is good. And it's a great safety feature that we have on a lot of these, on our controls. Now, we have a little more on these transformers. So it says here on this transformer, if, if the number of turns on the primary coil, so this is the primary, right here is the primary, right there, is less, uh, it, it, if the less, the number of turns on the primary core, the less voltage is induced. So this voltage would be less. The more turns we have here, we have more voltage induced. Now we talked about what induction is in our, uh, 
welding fab um, shop, right? So this is the same kind of word that we're using, this induced uh, voltage. And it's transformer basics. More wraps, more voltage is induced, okay? That's really what we're trying to say there. And I'm gonna go back to my little video here, okay? So let me just shrink that down, open this up. Okay. Circuits for electricity can be thought of as a path for electron flow created by joining the wires with the components to allow that transfer electrons from the source of electricity to that component like a bulb being lit. When it is said a circuit is closed, think of it as connected. When a circuit is open, think of it as off. So is that clear? Closed, connected, open, off. So anytime I say a switch is open, there is no current flow. It is off. Okay, so let me just um, shrink that down for a second. Um, I'm going to bring up this. So let me just uh, explain that a little bit more. So anytime I said a circuit was open, I mean it's off. Anytime I say a circuit is connected or it's closed the switch. So for example, if I had a switch, this switch is open. You see it's open here, meaning that it's off. If I had a switch then that is closed, it's connected. So this switch is closed and it's connected and we have flow of electrons through that. So this is really, it's, it's a little bit different from what we would know as a valve being open or a valve being closed. It's kind of the opposite. So this is just some of the terminology and vernacular that we use to describe electron flow. Is that clear? Everybody's good with that? Okay, we're gonna continue on with this. video or not working. A series circuit is the simplest of all circuits. When I see a series circuit, I think of a circle, meaning it starts with the power source and ends with the power source, with any components in line with that circle. If any component is not functioning or burnt out, none of the components or lights will work in that circuit. The path of electricity is not able to complete the circuit. Oh. Um, so that circuit, that circuit was kind of like my old, uh, well, when I was a kid, we used to have Christmas lights that were in series. And that series circuit, my dad would, would come to me and say, son, here is a bunch of new bulbs. I have all these bulbs all in a row. And I would have to remove each and every one of these while it was plugged in to determine which one was burnt out. Because if one was burnt out, guess what? All of them wouldn't work. So if one was out, none of them would work. So that's really how my Christmas lights used to be it was a big series circuit. So it starts with the power and it ends at the power source. So I would have a resistor in here. I would have a resistor in there. And resistors can sometimes be a load. It could be a light. 
It could be a solenoid. It could be whatever it is that is using the voltage or the electrons in that circuit. It could be a limit switch. Well, no, it's not a limit switch. It's not, that's not using, um, it will have resistance, but it's just something in a series circuit, okay? And then we can have a little switch in here, little pressure switch so we could click it on and off. This was, this would be a manual switch to move this off and on these little lights. So series, it's one big circle. It could look different, but a series circuit is just a big circle is what it is. Okay. Any questions so far? Am I going too fast? Am I going too slow? You guys are just full of it today. Okay, let's get back to this video. We're gonna start talking about Ohm's law. George Ohm, a German physicist and former high school teacher, determined in 1827 that there is a direct proportionality between the potential difference applied across a conductor and the resultant electric current. This relationship is now known as Ohm's law. So the first time I ever heard that statement, I, I had no idea of what he was kind of saying there. Okay, it took me a bit, but here, here's another way to say it. We could say it this way. An increase in voltage will increase current flow if the resistance of the circuit remains constant. Now, when I read that out of the ILM, I still had no idea kind of what was going on here. So we could say it this way. Or an increase in resistance will cause a decrease in current flow if voltage remains constant. Again, I <laughs> really didn't understand what that was saying or what he was trying to say in that. So they came up with a better way, and I'm going to just kind of explain this quickly. Um, let's see if I can share this screen. What they're trying to say here is that E equals I times R. That's basically what it is, where E Remember what E was? Electromotive force or volts. I was the intensity or amperage and R was the resistance or ohms. Okay, so those are the three letters that we use to use ohms law is what this is. So what he was saying there, if I had more resistance, there's a direct proportionality between the voltage. So this, if this was a multiplier, so if this number is bigger, this is gonna be bigger. So if this number was smaller, this voltage is going to be smaller or measured smaller. And that also uh, goes for the amperage. If the amperage number is bigger, we will have a bigger reading in voltage. If the amperage number is less, we will have a lesser number in voltage. We would read less. They're just multipliers. And there is a, dis a direct relationship proportionality to what any one of these read depending upon the numbers. 
So we also said that in uh, this, this would be the pressure. This would be the flow. And this would be the friction. It's like a piping system with water going through it, right? Very similar. Now. I want you to get out your calculators. We're gonna maybe start calculating some Ohm's law according to some of these circuits. The electrical values used in Ohm's law are usually represented by capital letters. V for voltage, I, for intensity or amperage, R for resistance or ohms. We use this formula triangle for memorization. There's our formula triangle for Ohm's law. I times R is equal to volts, okay? So have that handy and we're gonna move on. This slide will start to deal with resistance calculations. It is important to realize a few things that will happen with the individual circuits mentioned in the previous slides. When a circuit has a light or other electrical device or a load, these loads will have a certain amount of resistance. The formula for calculating the total resistance in a series circuit is as follows. Resi okay, this is for a series circuit only. Okay, that's important. Series only. Resistance total is equal to the first resistor plus the second resistor plus the third resistor, or in a series circuit, all resistances are additive. This series circuit pictured here has resistors of 10 ohms, another one is 10, and another one is 10. So what is the total resistance of that circuit? Anybody? 30. 30. Oh my God, you guys are so sharp. That is awesome. That is exactly right. We simply add these together and our total resistance is 30 ohms. This slide shows an example of using Ohm's law to calculate for the missing factor. We have a simple series circuit with one resistor at 10 ohms, the second resistor at 10 ohms, and a supply power at 120 volts AC. What is the amperage of this circuit? Okay, so there's, there's a question being posed. So first off, anytime I do any calculation, I have to find my resistance total first. So in this circuit, my resistance total is 20 ohms. So using the formula triangle, you should be able to figure out what the amperage is of the circuit. Does anybody know? Shout it out. Anybody? 12. 12. Six. Let's run the screen and we can see what the answer is. Using our formula, we can then determine that 120 volts AC divided by our resistance total, which is 20 ohms. Okay, now can you see how we do this? Is equal to 6 amps. So that circuit right there is only 6 amps. So the current or the intensity is six amps. Um, so we have to get our resistance total first before we do any calculation using Ohm's law. In this next slide, let's use Ohm's law to calculate for the missing factor. We have a simple series circuit with one 4 ohm resistor and another 4 ohm resistor with a 15 amp current. What is the voltage of this circuit? Okay, 
When you get the answer, shout it out. 120. Ah, you guys are awesome. That is correct. So let the slide play and it'll do the math. Using for our it. formula, V equals I times R. So V would equal 15 amps, which is the intensity of the current, times 8 ohms, which is the resistance of that circuit. So V equals 120 volts alternating current. This slide deals with parallel circuits that have multiple paths. But I don't know if you can hear that very well. But in a parallel circuit, so when my dad finally got a job, he bought a parallel circuit Christmas lights. As you can see in this, you can, you can basically um, have one light burnt out, but they still all go on because the path of electricity is allowed to be split and it can flow in separate ways. So this is a parallel circuit where your resistance or your resistors or whatever components you want to light up or run or whatever are in parallel. So you can actually even put switches and everything else all over the place on this. And this is the way that some lights are used in our household where you're down a set of stairs, so one light turns it on and the light upstairs turns it off, that sort of thing, or it controls a couple of different lights. They're running that power source through these resistors in parallel and we can control it differently. Okay, that's really what that says. Oh, combining a series circuit. Let me go forward again. Oh, I don't want to go fast. I just want to go. Oh, it's uh, normal. Of that circuit. Okay, let me go back this, one more. There this slide deals with parallel circuits. Series parallel circuits. This is the process of combining a series circuit and a parallel circuit. All current will flow through some portions of the circuit, but current will flow and divide in some sections of that circuit and reunite back to the source. This diagram shows a series parallel circuit. Okay, I wanna just pause there for a second. So I wanna draw you a picture of a series parallel circuit that is more indicative or what we want to see. Okay, so I'm going to do that before the break. I'm going to just draw a series parallel circuit that works for us. Um, let me just, uh, I need something to go. Uh, hang on a second. Okay, so um, I'm going to draw a thermal pile power source. So a thermal pile is drawn like this. Now, this is not a great drawing because I'm kind of freehanding this. Any kind of drawing that we have should always be with a straight edge if we're going to do that. Okay, so this is my power source, and I would call this a power pile. Can you share your screen? Yeah. Oh, my gosh, I'm not sharing my screen. Sorry about that. There we go. So I'm going to call this a power pile or a thermal pile. And this is my thermal electric device. That's what this is. And then I'm going to run the wires and I'm going to use, I'm going to put something in here. I'm going to put a limit switch in here. And this 
this little indication right here, this thing right here indicates a bimetal strip or a temperature actuated device. And what it does is on heat rise, if it gets too hot, this limit switch, it will lift and open the circuit. Okay, so that's what that does. And then I'm gonna run this over to a thermostat and it is also a bimetal strip with a thermal, it's on heat rise, it opens and on heat drop, it closes. And once that closes, I'm going to run this a little farther and I'm gonna put a gas valve coil or a solenoid right here. So this is a thermostat. This is a gas valve. And then I've got to run it back to the power source. Just like that. So that would be a series circuit, yes? Does everybody see the big circle? It is a series circuit. But in this particular drawing, I would say there's really no safety built in. So what I do for this, I would then run. Now, this is going to be a dotted line because we can't physically see this line because it would be buried inside the gas valve. And I'm going to put another solenoid in here. And I'm going to call this one a power unit. I think I drew a power unit for you guys when we're in weld fab class. And I showed you what a power unit does. That's the one with the plunger to hold down to allow the gas flow uh, until that thermal couple heats up enough till it creates enough electrical energy to keep that power unit open. And then this comes all the way back to the power source because it has to have a power source, start and finish. So right here on this power unit, this power unit has to be engaged first. And then this thermostat would work automatically opening and closing right in here all by itself, allowing that gas to flow when we need it, as long as we have this safety device in here. And this, is a series parallel circuit. So this is a series, series, parallel. So we have one series right here. There's the series. And then in parallel, we have this other one on top of it. And this circuit right here, this is an electrical circuit for a decorative appliance. Like a fireplace. Anybody seen a gas burning fireplace? This is the wiring diagram used for a gas burning fireplace. See the exact wiring. It's the components that you see there. And it needs no outside power source to operate. The power pile generates enough voltage to power up that whole circuit. A quick question. Yes. So you said the power unit would be used to initially start it though, right? Well, it, it also, once, once this uh, is engaged, it will produce okay. about 750 millivolts DC and it will keep that constant as long as that pilot burner is on that thermocouple or thermopile. Okay. I'm just wondering the power unit, should it not open the gas valve as well? It 
No, the power unit opens the pilot gas. Okay. Just the pilot tubing, Christian. And then the main gas valve is on this solenoid down here. So you would have two things. You would have two pilot, or you would have a pilot tube and you would have a main valve. Okay. So before we go to break, I want to show you a quick PowerPoint kind of showing this a little bit. Um, maybe not, I'm gonna have to queue it up. So why don't we, okay, so we're gonna continue and we're gonna start talking about electrical circuits and how to, uh, excuse me, parallel circuits and how to calculate Ohm's law on those. So here we go. This next slide will show us how to calculate resistance in a parallel circuit. Here is the formula. 1 over resistance total is equal to 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2 plus 1 over R3. So as you can see here, this is the formula for calculating just the resistance in a parallel circuit. Now, as you, as you can well imagine, the resistance in a parallel circuit is significantly reduced. It's reduced because we have multiple paths for the electron flow within that circuit. So to calculate it, we actually put it over one. That resistor is over one and that's how we calculate it. So here we go. This parallel circuit shows R1 is four, R2 is eight, and R3 is 20. We insert those within our formula so we put them as a fraction, but for us to calculate to the number and to get the number that we need, we have to then put them in. And then we convert them to decimal, decimal places. So you can see one quarter is equal to 0 0.25, one over eight is equal to 0 0.125, and one over 20 is equal to 0 0.05. And then we come up with one over resistance total is equal to 0 0.425. And then now we have to then put our resistance total that 0 0.425 into one over 0 0.425. And that's how we calculate the resistance total. Or one over 0 0.425 we divide that out and we have a total resistance of 2.353 ohms. So look at this, right? It's, it's, it's absolutely crazy that we have these resistors and look at my total resistance. My total resistance is absolutely just tiny comparatively to what these resistors are, right? 28 and four. And look at how much I have as a total. So this is the ability how we can have multiple resistors or multiple lights on a string of Christmas lights is we run them in parallel. Parallel is the, is the best way to run these things because you're using less resistance and the power is able to run through all of those. Now, of course, if we have too many, it, it can be a little too much for any one system. But this is how they want things to run. If they're in parallel, they certainly run a little more efficiently than in series. Yes? Okay, let me just clear that drawing. And we will continue. This slide will show us using Ohm's law how to calculate for the missing factor in a parallel circuit. So the question is being posed, what is the amperage of this circuit? And I'll give you guys a, a couple of minutes to try and calculate the amps of this circuit.
So again, this is how we calculate for a series, or excuse me, a parallel circuit. Thanks, Christian, for that. Okay, so the next slide on here. Apps. For this slide, I would like you to refer to your module ILM 060207C. That might not be the right ILM. Um, but anyways, what we have here is anytime we have steel piping underground, okay, anytime there is steel piping underground, we need some kind of protection. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing. I'm going to go back to my whiteboard here. Um, and there we go. So this... Um, what we have is we need protection with steel because what happens is we have a cathode. Oh, that didn't go right. A cathode and an anode. And what happens is you have electron flow going between these things. And what happens is the material actually gets eroded away, okay? So there's a, a chemical action or that happens and this is what happens. So for example, if you have two dissimilar metals like copper and steel, ooh, steel, and if they're touching each other, you will have electron flow and one will consume the other. It's just something that we do. So on hot water tanks, for example, we have a, usually a little rubber seal um, from copper to, and sometimes our dip tubes are made of galvanized metal. So they have sometimes called a dielectric union, sometimes. We have this dielectric union to prevent those two metals from touching. And those two metals, they usually have a rubber gasket in between as well to prevent that from happening. In bigger piping systems that we have underground, we could use a sacrificial anode. And that sacrificial, I, I spelled that wrong, sacrificial anode is usually made of magnesium. And they could tie this sacrificial anode right to the steel pipe. And what would happen is the dirt would eat the magnesium before the steel pipe, making it last uh, a whole lot longer. That is, Richard, the stupid rod that you replace on the hot water heater in the trailer. That is correct. That sacrificial anode of magnesium is what that is as well. Um, the harder the water you have, uh, the more ions that are floating around in that water and will then eat away the liner of the hot water tank. That's why we have that sacrificial anode of magnesium in there. So it'll eat that first before the metal of the container of the hot water tank. That is correct. Um, so in bigger piping systems that we have underground, we use a coating on the pipe, uh, sometimes referred to as a yellow jacket, right? For gas lines, we have yellow jacketed gas, but they usually have a barrier or sometimes it's painted sometimes and it's to prevent that oxidization of the piping or breaking down of that piping. Sometimes we have what they call, like if you had a pipe underground, and then we had dirt over top of it, right? There's my dirt over top of my pipe. And then we had, uh, sometimes you see these little huts out in the middle of a field 
over a piping uh, system. And what they do is on the pipe, they come up to this and they impress a current through this to the pipe. So it prevents the anode cathode thing underground. So they impress a current into there so it does not eat their piping systems. And as you can see, piping, underground piping is, man, we rely on it a lot, right? And if you put plastics, plastic piping underground, you don't have this problem. That's why most of the water lines that we use nowadays in, in, in residential applications, underground water is almost plastic. Almost all of it is. Now in older cities like Toronto, Vancouver, they still have a lot of dur iron underground. So iron pipe underground conveying water. And that stuff leaks. They have water main breaks all the time. And that's why they're replacing a lot of this infrastructure with plastics because it doesn't eat the plastics as much. Cool. All right. So let's start talking about some circuits. I'm going to do some calculations with you um, on, on the board here. And so get out your calculators and your pencils and we're, we're gonna do some uh, calculations according to Ohm's law. So let me just draw a nice circuit in here. I, I mean, as best as I can, I might be really bad at it. So there's always a power source. And if I have a resistor, a res oh, man, this is just terrible. Let me get this straight. Oh dear. Oh, sorry about that. We'll get there eventually. So if I had a resistor, and if I had a resistor, this is really horrible. Resistor, resistor. If I had a power source of 20 volts AC, I had a 10 ohm resistor and a 10 ohm resistor. What is my amperage? Remember our formula triangle volts. It's amps, ohms. What was your answer? Somebody said it there already. Yeah. Kristen, clay pipe, is it used for drainage rather than water supply? They can have it as water supply too, but not as much. One amp, that is right. So we take our resistance total is equal to 20 ohms. So it says here to put my voltage divided by my ohms, one amp. Yeah, I think it's mostly drainage too. Vitrified clay pipe was used a lot in drainage. I hated digging up anything around clay pipe because you just look at that stuff, it cracks and leaks. So it was awful. I, I remember some of that stuff in some older towns. It's not great. So I'm gonna draw a really difficult question here and we'll see if anybody can come up with the answer. So I have a power source. I have a resistor. I have a resistor. Another resistor. 
another resistor. I'm going to give you some measurements here. I'm going to say you have a voltage of, I don't know, you have an intensity of 15 amps. You have 10 ohms, 10 ohms, 10 ohms, 10 ohms, 10 ohms, 10 ohms. 10 ohms. I want to find the voltage. Nine hundred. Wow, that was pretty quick. That's pretty good. We're going to give it a few minutes, though. 